Well, good morning and welcome to the Wilson Center. My name is Robert Daly. I direct the Kissinger Institute on China and the United States at Wilson. And this is one of several institutes uh, that is co-sponsoring today's book launch. We're also working with the Asia program, with the Kennan Institute uh, on Russia, as well as the history and public policy program, all of which uh, have had a huge stake in the work of Katie Stollard and all of which uh, share in congratulating her on the publication of her new book, Dancing on Bones, History and Power in China, Russia, and North Korea, uh, which is just out from Oxford University Press. Uh, Katie Stollard is known to uh, many of the audience members here for the Wilson Center. She is now Senior Editor for China and Global Affairs at the New Statesman. She was previously a foreign correspondent for Sky News, where she was based in Russia and China. But during that time, she traveled throughout the region, uh, including to North Korea. She has reported from over 20 countries. And the experiences that she got as a reporter in the field uh, are spread throughout this book. Uh, the, the intermixture, uh, Katie, of, of really relevant storytelling with your broad themes and historical analysis. Uh, works extremely well. It's very rich. And Katie is also a former Wilson Fellow. Uh, she was a Wilson Fellow with us for about two years, uh, during which she also became a colleague uh, who we miss greatly. She worked as a moderator on many of our programs, as a spokesperson and discussant. And rather unusually for a Wilson Fellow, we also asked her to represent us at International Fora. She went uh, for the Kissinger Institute to India to participate in a trilateral dialogue uh, between Wilson uh, Russian analysts and Indian analysts. As I say, Katie, um, you're, you're much missed, but um, we, we wish you all good luck at, at the New Statesman. This book, uh, Dancing on Bones, couldn't be more timely. I know that it was a, a long time in the writing, but you must be pleased with the moment uh, at which it hit because it is about how historical narratives of victimization and national virtue serve contemporary leaders programs for building the power of themselves and their cliques, as well as their nations. It focuses in particular on use of the real history of World War II, but also the mythologization of World War II, how that is uh, used now by Vladimir Putin, and I think probably most of our listeners are familiar uh, with his use of those narratives to justify the invasion of Ukraine, but also by Xi Jinping and Kim Jong-un uh, in different ways. They rely on World War II narratives and connections of those narratives with more ancient founding national myths for their countries to justify their current governance. Uh, so extremely timely. We also see uh, tomorrow, President Biden will be in Asia and he'll be visiting South Korea and Japan, which in different ways uh, are also dealing with some of these legacies. Uh, and in particular, trying to sort out uh, the contemporary meeting of J Japan's uh, colonization of South Korea and the comfort women issue in particular. So I have asked Katie uh, to give us uh, a taste for what's in the book, which I hope you will read and to spend about 20 minutes doing that after which uh, we'll have a conversation and we look forward to questions from you. If you have a question that you would like to ask Katie, uh, please send it to us at china at wilsoncenter.org. China at wilsoncenter, one word, dot org. And we will try to get your question into the queue. Uh, but with that again, Katie, welcome. Uh, please tell us about Dancing on Bones. All right, thank you. And let me start with just a, a, the slightest uh, sense of the debt of gratitude that I owe to the Wilson Center. Um, I write in the acknowledgments that this book would not exist without the Wilson Center. Um, it's just so true. All of the, the programs that you mentioned, you know, your, your own program and all of, all of the great scholars at, at the Wilson Center who gave their time to discuss the ideas uh, in this book, supported my research, um, <laughs> suffered through many, many long um, uh, conversations and, and really just, you know, welcomed me into the centre, gave, gave me a home to, to work and write on this book. So, you know, the, the centre is just such an important institution. And for, you know, for journalists like me, it, it gave me somewhere to, to come in from, from, from these regions, to think through these ideas, to, to do, do the research. Um, so I'm just tremendously grateful um, to have spent so much, so much time there um, and, it, and it wouldn't exist without you all. So thank you. Um, let me start with how 
this book really started to, to take shape in, in my mind, which it, with hindsight, and perhaps I didn't fully realize um, at the time, was the early months of 2014. I was based in Russia at the time as the Moscow correspondent for Sky News, but I was spending a lot of time going backwards and forwards to Ukraine, where the what were known as the Maidan protests uh, were in full swing in Kiev, culminating in the overthrow of Viktor Yanukovych um, in February 2014. So the experience of that in, in Kiev was then this tremendous celebration, this sense that the protesters had achieved this great victory. But very quickly, we started to get reports that that was not how this was being received right across the country and that something quite sinister was going on in the Crimean Peninsula, where what were being described then as little green men, but which, of course, we know now were Russian soldiers without their insignia, were moving in to, to take over key government buildings, the airport, the main infrastructure there. So my team and I set off by car. We, we drove from Kiev down to Crimea to try and find out what, what was happening. And it, really, there was this formative experience right on, on the approach to, to Crimea in the middle of the night, which I, I opened the book with, where we got stopped by this checkpoint that in this case was manned by, by local volunteers in southeast Ukraine. Um, some of them had come across the border from Russia. Some of them were locals. They were all wearing, wearing masks, camouflage, camouflage gear. A number of them had guns um, and they, they stopped us and you know, were initially very, very angry that, that journalists were, were trying to to try to come towards the Crimean Peninsula, but the, the crew that I was with were entirely Russian. And once they started to, to speak to them um, in Russian, they, they relaxed and, and started to tell us from their perspective what they thought was happening in their country, which was, as they told us that night, that fascists and barbarians had taken over the capital Kiev and that they were right now threatening Russian speakers in the, in the southeast of the country. So they'd formed this barricade, they were stopping all the cars, checking them for, for guns and weapons, and determined to, to stop what they saw as this fascist coup that they were told from Russian state media had happened in Kiev uh, from happening where they were. But it was notable to me how much they referred immediately to the history of the Second World War. Um, a number of them had these the orange and black ribbon that's known as uh, the, the ribbon of St. George. I mean, it, it, it's associated with a battle order from the Second World War um, in the Soviet Union. A number of them were wearing that right from the very early days um, as this identifying symbol. And they were referencing that war. They were talking about, you know, this is the land where our ancestors fought during the, the great patriotic war, as the Second World War is known there. And we're here to make sure that that's not going to happen again. So I, I think I was aware early on of just how present references to that war were. And they just became central to both the, the campaign and the takeover of the Crimean Peninsula, where you would see billboards with you know uh, uh, the the text would say we we choose talking about the referendum and that choice was between a, a big black swastika and the russian flag so it was really being explained to people as this is effectively the, the, you know, it's the same fight of good against evil that took place in the Great Patriotic War. And once again, Russian speakers are being called to, to, to stand against these, these fascists um, and, and the, you know, what, what is portrayed in Russia as, as an attack on, on Russian speakers. And it was the same as the conflict started to get underway in, in Eastern Ukraine, you know, my, my team and I would cross backwards and forwards over the front line and you would really pass between these two totally separate realities. So you would come from, from Kiev and the, and the parts of the country that were more, more pro-European leaning and, and, and consuming more Ukrainian and European media. And then you would cross into the separatist controlled areas where they were primarily getting their information from Russian state television. And they just had this totally separate understanding of what was happening. They, they really, you know, a number of them really seemed to genuinely believe what they were being told about this, this fascist threat and that this was once again like the Great Patriotic War. You'd find you know, portraits of Stalin at checkpoints in the middle of nowhere and everywhere this symbol, the, the orange and black ribbon. So that really got me interested in, in how the history of that past war was being used in contemporary politics in Russia and the neighboring Russian speaking regions of Ukraine. And then I moved from there to China in 2015, where one of my first major assignments was covering um, what was being described as the Victory Day Parade there to commemorate the 70th anniversary of the end of uh, the Second World War in Asia. 
which was this extraordinary occasion. You know, it, it felt very much like some of what I had seen in Russia in Red Square, where you have these you know, great bombastic military processions. You know, the leaders are all there. Putin was there as, as she's guest of honor. You know, extraordinary choreography, fly past of all of the, the latest aircraft. Um, and, it, and it felt like this very long running tradition, but in fact, it wasn't. It was the first time that this parade had ever had ever happened. And it was the, a start of a, a push that was happening under Xi Jinping, where there was a, a series of new Memorial Days. There was a really what felt like a renewed focus there too on the history of the Second World War. And in fact, a couple of years after that, the, the formal length of the war was effectively almost doubled in China as a result of this, you know, the renewed scholarship that she called for on the war, instead of previously having been described as an eight year war of resistance, which was said to start in 1937, they then decided actually it would start in 1931 and it would now be described in all of the textbooks and all of the museum exhibits as the 14 year war of resistance, which you know absolutely there is a historical basis um, to make that claim, but it also suited the political interests of the communist party and it included then the early years of the war and what had previously been treated as, as a separate regional conflict in the Northeast, in Manchuria, and, and crucially a period when the, the communist soldiers were, were more actively involved in the fighting. So I, I was, became kind of interested in, in why this period of history and how, how central the history of the wars of the last century were in the current politics of, of both of these countries. And then I got the chance to go to North Korea where I had been reporting on, on North Korea um, pretty extensively from Beijing, covering you know, the, the missile tests, the, the weapons tests, the latest news that, that was coming out of there. But when I actually got to go there on the ground, I was really struck by how present the history, in, in that case, particularly the history of the Korean War was in daily life and how much that history really informed and, and played such a key part of the, the justification for the current weapons programs. It was really seemed to be front and center of the case that, that the Kim dynasty, now, now run by, by Kim Jong-un, but, but previously you know, his father and his grandfather also made similar arguments that because of the experience as they present it falsely um, of having been attacked in during the Korean War and having suffered terribly, which that part is true, that therefore they needed to build up their military strength, they needed to develop these weapons programs and they needed to be able to defend their country from the same thing happening again. So I, I started and somewhat, somewhat naively with hindsight, um, decided I would then, you know, I, I would get to the bottom of, of what was happening here why were these three countries, which you know I was really focused on in my role as a as a as a news reporter, and in you know the threat they posed to U.S. security, European security, the international order? I felt we were looking at them all of the time from this sort of external perspective and, and trying to trying to determine the nature of the threat that they posed, but we weren't necessarily understanding the case they were making to their own people and how central this history was to, to the ideas that, that the current regimes were pushing. So I wanted to trace back, you know, how did this start? Because in some cases, these, the, these stories have really come and gone over the years in, in, in both Russia and China, particularly you know, for decades after the end of the Second World War, the, the respective regimes were, were just not that interested in front and centering those commemorations. In, in the Russian case, it wasn't till the mid 1960s under Brezhnev that the Second World War history um, started to really be brought back. And in the Chinese case, it was even longer. It wasn't until, until after the death of Mao Zedong and the mid 1980s that the war story really started to be re-examined and, and figures like, like the, the Kuomintang and the, the sacrifices of their soldiers could be brought into the war story. So I wanted to trace back, you know, how has this history been, been manipulated, been exploited, been mobilized in these countries over the years and what role does it play now? Um, you know, and with hindsight, I should have been better able to see what was coming in Ukraine now. You know, when you go back and trace through everything that has happened, and in, in the Russian case in particular, how Putin has really turned to the history of the Second World War, you know, right from his earliest days in power, how he's elevated that history, the memorial ceremonies uh, around the Second World War, you know, he has been making the case that Russia faces, you know, a, a similar fascist resurgence um, as it as it, you know, uh, presents that it did during the war. 
since the since the mid 2000s you know he he really set into that in earnest from 2014 when the the kremlin really started to push um, heavily this idea that fascists have taken control of of kiev and the kind of stories and the, and the propaganda that, that people i was speaking to there on the ground were were absorbing you know that that push really started in earnest in 2014 and i think we're seeing you know, the, the culmination of that now how, how deeply seeded these narratives are and some of the you know the ideas that they that these regimes are are mobilizing and that are animating them um i'll wrap up shortly i, I just i, I want to say i guess um you know I, I came to this as as a reporter um i wanted to 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 dig into the you know the, the scholarship and the literature and and try to bring a critical understanding to this but really first and foremost for me this book was about you know getting on the ground to the extent that i could speaking to as many uh, terrible journalese but, but real people as i could to understand how how they were um how they were receiving and absorbing these narratives and to look at the role these histories and these and this these ideas play in the current regimes you know i think there can be somewhat of a tendency um from the outside to assume that you know these are repressive autocratic strong men they they rule through force you know repression brutality alone that they, you know they're, they're sitting in in their command centers you know giving orders and, and those orders are, are are carried out without question on the ground and you know certainly re repression security surveillance corruption play enormous parts in how they do wield power but i felt we were missing some of the some of the stories about the, the case they make to their own people and the extent to which uh, they were drawing on this on this on this, the history of these wars, and in particular, the history of, of past uh, past humiliation. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll wrap up there. I want to leave plenty of time to, to actually discuss it with you and 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 hear your own uh, thoughts on this. But but essentially, it's it's an attempt to take readers on the ground in these countries and unpack what are what are the ideas, the regimes that are they're animating these regimes, and how are they drawing on the history of these past wars. So well, thank you, Katie. Again, for the audience, any questions uh, for Katie Stallard, please send them to us at china at wilsoncenter.org. Uh, but I have a few questions I'd like to ask you uh, initially, Katie. And you mentioned you know, that you write as a reporter, and that really shows throughout the book in the best possible way. Uh, it's very well written, I gotta say. It's just I, I move through it with great sort of ease and understanding. So congratulations just at, at the sentence level as well as at the analytic level. It was really a pleasure to read. Uh, you point out that, and I'm, I'm, I'm reading now, this behavior is not unique to autocrats. It is not unusual for democratic leaders to appeal to a glorious, uncomplicated version of the past and gloss over the dark and shameful episodes of the country's history. Nostalgia is a powerful drug. I remember when uh, Tom Brokaw came out with The Greatest Generation. Uh, an extremely successful title that has sort of become a brand and a, a lens through which many people look at this experience, obviously heavily moralized and self-congratulatory, but you know, with also some real history behind it. Uh, but we didn't write greatest generation into the constitution. What is given that all countries do this to a considerable degree, and we see it playing out in the United States now and a lot of the D debates about history, civil war history, civil rights history. What is the difference? What, what makes it especially toxic or dangerous in some cases, as opposed to sort of merely human in, in others? What, what, what do you see? Is, is, is there a formula for, for real trouble in the invocation of, of national myths? Yes, I, I think it's first and foremost when that becomes the only version of history. You know, I, I'm really glad you, you, you brought this up and, and you read out that section because I wanted to be clear that this is not, you know, something that only autocrats ha, have thought of. And, you know, my own experience growing up in, in the UK, you know, the Second World War history is a fundamental part of our national identity there. And it played an important political role. You know, it was cynically exploited there during the, the Brexit referendum. And, and here, where we're talking now in the United States, you know, we're seeing a very live discussion about what aspects of the past should be remembered and whether it's patriotic or not to remember the darker aspects of history. I mean, I think two points that that I came to in the book were, you know, number one on, on that latter question of, of whether it's unpatriotic to remember and question the past. You know, I, I could not 
I could not disagree more strongly. Um, you know, the, the point I really came out to was that we should understand whose interests these narratives are, are serving and that presenting this past as this glorious, nostalgic, halcyon uh, myth that can't be questioned and is, and is sacred, that only serves to entrench existing power structures and it helps uh, those who are currently in power. So it's not in, in our interests as, as citizens um, to, to just accept that unquestioningly. Um, but I think what, what is dangerous in all three of these cases is that it, it now is so dominant in the official discourse. So here, you know, you, you can have a situation where the president appeals to a, a version of history or as Donald Trump did, set up the 1776 Patriotic Education Commission. And then you can have you know, a number of, of very well-respected independent scholars writing op-eds, um, you know, criticizing why that version of history, why this, why it's ahistorical, a questioning how, how dangerous that is. And then you have a, a change of presidency that can, that can you know, scrap that idea as, as Biden did when he first came in. So there is the ability still to look critically and to challenge these myths um, in these societies. But in, in Russia, China, and North Korea, it has just become so dangerous um, and you know you are taking on so much personal risk to do it. I mean, people are still doing it. And I, I, I wanted to emphasize um, in the book that there are still many brave, principled, independent scholars and historians who are still at great personal cost and risk um, challenging these stories and refusing to accept them. But you know they become voices that are in the minority if they can even be heard at all. You know, you, you have, in China, you know, there's a hotline to report instances of, of historical nihilism, as the party calls it, that you see online, and to have those posts deleted and their authors, as, as is the case in Luo Changping, who's just been sentenced to, to seven months in, in prison in China for perceived um, defaming martyrs during during the Korean War. You know, you're risking a prison sentence um, if you if you question these these narratives. So it's it becomes difficult and dangerous at the personal level, and then I think at the level of officials, these become the dominant ideas that are driving their discourse, their statements. These become the, you know, the, the kind of terms that Chinese diplomats are required to use now to, you know, to talk about the importance of never conceding an inch, you know, to accuse um, the United States of, of trying, to, trying to humiliate China as it has in the past. So these, these narratives become dominant in the discourse and at the at the policy level, um, and I think that that's when this is dangerous because also that you know these versions of history do strip out the atrocities, the horrors, you know the the darker aspects of these wars, and you're left more and more with just the sense that you know, this is an unquestionably uh, positive narrative. You know the country faced great threat. It rallied under these strong leaders, the people fought back and they secured glory for themselves. So those ideas can be quite dangerous when they become the only or at least the overwhelmingly dominant version of history. Tell us about, you, you use this phrase historical nihilism, which those of us who watch China closely are very familiar with, but it's a very strange phrase uh, to most other people who, who haven't heard of it. Uh, it's not immediately obvious what it means. Could you tell us a little bit about that discourse and how that's being used? Yes, yeah, so this is something that the, the phrase has its, has its origins. Actually, I, I think back during the during the Cultural Revolution, but it was not a popular term until the the Xi Jinping, uh, I, I want to say era, um, until certainly until until Xi Jinping came to power. And actually, you know, one of the scholars that I that I spoke to in China showed me what happened on the on the CNKI um, database, this database of, of Chinese. Um, articles when you type in historical nihilism and you look at the publications and and before 2012 you know you, you see occasional small peaks and, and this held actually two when he did the same for the people's daily um database you see you know occasional small um small small peaks on under the search term historical nihilism and then from 2014 on it just you know it shoots vertiginously up you know once, once she had signaled and he, and he did signal in, in late 2012 and early 2013, he started to, to talk about historical nihilism, which I guess I, I describe in the book as uh, effectively attempts to, to subvert or attack the party's version of history. Um, that's what he means when he says historical nihilism. But he identifies that these, these, these two early speeches in December 2012 and January 2013, where he says that that played a crucial role in the collapse of the Soviet Union. He talks about how you know, they had lost control of ideology. There were attacks on 
Lenin attacks on Stalin, historical nihilism was out of control. So he, he, he sees, he diagnosed losing control of the official version of history as a crucial contributor to the collapse of the Soviet Union. And he's clear that they must not allow the same thing to happen in China. And you see that language then in, in document number nine, this document that, that, was, that was leaked, uh, but had been circulated to senior officials describing historical nihilism as one of these seven grave perils, as they were described, that, that could form a threat to the Communist Party's grip on power. So right from the start of Xi's term in power, he identifies history as a, as a crucial resource that needs to be carefully controlled. Um, and, he, and he starts what is now, you know, the historical nihilism campaign um, is now very, very widespread. It's something that, as I say, there's, there's a hotline, there's an anonymous tips reporting line for citizens and netizens to, to report instances of historical nihilism that they see. And it, and it can be a serious charge to be accused of, of historical nihilism. So I think that's that's quite a specific change in the Chinese case since she has come to power. And you know, speaking to, to, to scholars there, when I, when I was in Beijing, they would talk about how it had just, it, there had always been sensitivities. You had always had to navigate carefully around history, no matter who the leader was, but they really felt that under Xi Jinping, then the avenues um, that they that they had had, like Yan Hong Chuncha, that you know, journals that that previously had been able to air some of these ideas at least carefully, um, now just couldn't do it at, at all. Um, clearly, that you know, there was a top level decision that history itself um, was now deeply sensitive, and the party needed to keep get a get a very firm grip on the narrative and and, and silence challenges to that version of history. So we, we were talking uh, here on Zoom before the program started about how world the World War II experience is remains so central. It's the touchstone, you know, historical, national, in some cases moral, not just for the three countries you write about, but for a lot of countries in the West and so for the major combatants. Uh, but of course, that isn't true for everybody. And, and we have a question here uh, from Diana Negroponte uh, at the Wilson Center about this. And Diana asks, how might we apply your hypothesis to the memory of colonialism? You know, another major trauma uh, for much of the world. Uh, the fight for freedoms and the fear of external intervention continues to be raised critically in Zimbabwe and other parts of Southern Africa, as well as Algeria and much of Northern Africa. So do you see these patterns that you here uh, identify with memory of World War II the way that it's used today, do you, do you see that replicated in, in other areas who have other central narratives, colonialism in particular? Well, first, it's wonderful to hear from Diana, and I, I very much miss our, our conversations at the Wilson Center, and it's, it's a great question. I, I think what is common to both of these narratives and what is so potent about them is that they draw on real lived experiences. You, you mentioned how you know, how, how central the, the World War II history is, I think, you know, in our, in our own societies, you know, in the Chinese and Russian cases in particular, you know, it's important to understand just how much of the population these conflicts touched, you know, how many tens of millions of people died in, in these wars and, and how great the suffering was um, in North Korea during the Korean War. So these narratives are drawing on real lived family level experiences that resonate deeply um, across across the country and, and across citizens. So while they have been manipulated and distorted, there is there is truth and there are real experiences um, at, at their core. And it, so I think that is that is what is what is common then to, to an area I know I know much less about. So I, I won't pretend to, to know um, a great deal about about how the colonialism narratives are, are being mobilized. But I think what is what is in common is that these are experiences that really do touch and resonate with the wider population and therefore are very potent in, in the hands of, of contemporary politicians in the way that, you know, appeals to, you know, hollow propaganda slogans or, or talking about GDP levels just isn't. These are, these are emotional resident, resonant narratives that go much more to the, to the core of our identities and our beliefs about ourselves um, on our on our history, so I you know I, I think it's important to look um, look critically at how are the how these narratives are are being mobilized and who they're being designed to appeal to. Another question from the online audience, but first a reminder: uh, if you have a question for Katie Stollard, please send it to us at china at wilsoncenter.org. 
Here's your question. I worked at NATO for a while, and in this context, met with a lot of military uh, and diplomats from former USSR countries. They all claimed that nobody believed Moscow's propaganda at the time. How do you explain that the current propaganda seems to be so efficient that people now seem to believe it uh, in a way that they didn't previously? Why is it resonating so much in Russia in particular? Well, I mean, one great caveat that I would inject at the start of this is that it's becoming increasingly hard to know um, what people genuinely do and, and don't believe. Um, certainly in terms of some of the latest um, polling that's been done using, for instance, list experiments, um, which is, enables people to, to speak more freely, um, the evidence that, that we're seeing is that there is majority support for this war and for the idea that this is an attack on Russia. You know, I think somewhat this is equivalent to if it was if it was two decades after the revolution. I think one and one of the reasons that that the Communist Party turns to the war in the Soviet Union in the 1960s is this sense that the official slogans and, and certainly you know Lenin's speeches, Lenin's portrait everywhere, that they kind of had lost their real emotional pull. People would still kind of would still repeat their required lines, but but you're right, people you know didn't necessarily buy into it personally. But I think the turn to the war and the and the push now to frame the current um, actions in terms of of that past war is a real cynical attempt to pull on these emotional threads in a way that that does resonate and to draw on I think what Putin has done is woven this, the story of the war into the story of the Soviet collapse so when, when he is is talking particularly in the early 2000s when he's first come to power and the memory of you know the humiliation the real shortages you know the real sense that that Russia or the Soviet Union had disappeared and, and what was left in its place was very uncertain he's drawing on on that um when he talks about the war and how China uh, sorry not China how Russia has has been disrespected and how it needs to reclaim its its great and glorious sense of of past pride so I think he he is really repurposed um the wartime history to speak to those feelings of humiliation and loss um, and, and you know, economic chaos and, and real suffering that, that people experienced after the collapse of the Soviet Union. So I, I think that's part of what is making um, these narratives so dominant. And he also, you know, he himself was and, and, and remains as best as we can tell, quite a genuinely popular leader. He is he has given um, Russian citizens something to get behind and a figure that they can, well, at least could be proud of. You know, a, a guy who was once again bestriding the, the world stage and, and representing Russia's interests. So I think in the person of Vladimir Putin, he's combining um, these, these very potent narratives and the evidence is, as best as we can see it is that this is proving quite effective so far. We have a question now, Katie, uh, from your former colleague, Stapleton Roy, who's going to ask you to flip this around. He asks, he, he, was, in, you, he was in the book, Stapleton. <laughs> can in the you book. comment on the role that historical interpretation is playing in Ukrainian resistance to the Russian version of history? This is being used by both sides, right? Yeah, and we saw this, I mean, really dueling narratives on, on Victory Day, May 9th, um, the anniversary of the end of the war. Putin and Zelensky gave back to back and opposite speeches where they were each trying to essentially the central argument is we are the good guys. Those lot are the enemy. Um, so, so Putin was was claiming that this was once again the Great Patriotic War, and once again Russia was being called to to fight against the Nazi menace. And Zelensky gave a very powerful speech where he said, "No, you know, actually, Ukrainians also fought and died against Hitler in the Great Patriotic War and or in World War II, and once again, you know, we are we are fighting our own." fascist menace, we will be victorious. And as he put it in the future, we will have two victory days. So he was, I think you saw this real effort by Zelensky to reclaim Ukraine's history during that war and repurpose it for his own purposes now. And, and he actually drew on, on an even broader set of wars. So he drew both on, on the Second World War, which he has you know family links to, his, his grandfather fought during that war, but he also set that in the context of all of the previous threats. Um, that, that Ukraine has, has faced. You know, he, he talked about the ancient hordes that had also threatened Ukraine and how Ukrainians had repelled them. So he is very much 
drawing on that history for his own purposes and using that to speak directly to his frontline troops, to his citizens, and to inspire them to their to their own resistance. So we're seeing, you know, alongside the actual, you know, the, the terrible, brutal war on the ground, also this very real contest for for history between these two countries. Katie, I think one of the great strengths of the book is that you you don't simply say uh, all of these national myths and these uses of history are you know mere propagandistic nonsense. You point out when there's really me very meaningful history behind them, and in particular. Uh, there's a lot of sympathy uh, in the book for the peoples who, who suffered during World War II and afterward, and, and, and why, based on that, that suffering, they would you know, be able to be moved by propaganda of this sort. So understanding that, understanding the way that people respond to this based on their real experience, as well as their, their experience of propaganda, what might that mean, you think, for our diplomacy and the way that we speak to other countries and to other publics? Um, can we do more to acknowledge uh, what is real and valuable and meaningful in their historical narratives and suffering uh, as a way of getting a more balanced message across? And I, I ask this because you know, there's so much talk now about uh, democracy and authoritarianism as grand narratives, uh, growing accusations that, that, that everybody who's anybody is a fascist. Uh, is, is there a role for understanding and public diplomacy based on the kind of approach you take in your book? And could, could we bring more of that into our speeches and public pronouncements? Yes, you know, I, I think this, this book is, is my attempt to understand those ideas and their appeal and how they're being mobilized now. But a part of this story and the, the grievance aspect is that these past sacrifices are not understood and are not recognized in the West. And, you know, there's truth in that. You know, growing up in the UK, the amount that I learned about the Soviet role in the war was about how German supply lines had been overextended. You know, I, I remember talking about, how, you know, how, how the, the cold and, and, and lack of food play, played a role. But really, overwhelmingly, the focus was on the heroism of the Western Front and the involvement of, of the US and the UK. And I don't think I learned anything at all about what China's role in that war was um, back at, at high school. So I think, you know, first and foremost, we should acknowledge the very real suffering and sacrifice that, that took part in these countries and, and the horrific um, casualties that, that were sustained, because that would start to speak to some of these grievances. You know, the, the idea that, that Putin is pushing and, and, and she is talking about too, is this idea that people are trying to steal our past heroism, that they're trying to undermine um, our great sacrifice. So we are defending our history against these, you know, the, these people in the West who are trying to rewrite in and, and steal our past glory. So I think, you know, we, we can start with an acknowledgement of, you know, real people, real experiences, real suffering in these wars that, that, that may take at least some of the air um, out, out of this, the, the grievance and the idea that these leaders need to defend their, their country's history against, against any. I think that was probably a typical American and that growing up my views of World War II were shaped by films, you know, Patton, Battle of the Bulge, Bridge on the River Kwai to a degree. It wasn't until I read uh, Timothy Snyder's Bloodlands that I began to understand what the war had really meant in the East and how inadequate those narratives uh, had been, the triumphalist American uh, views. We have another question from the audience um, who says, uh, what are your thoughts about how best to counter the manipulation of history? So this is a different sort of the mirror image of the question that I just asked about sympathy and public diplomacy. For example, should we dramatically step up funding for the Voice of America, the BBC, uh, Radio Free, Free Europe and Radio Free Asia, uh, should we radically reform their content? Uh, so in addition to say the, the sympathetic public diplomacy side, what about really trying to counter and, and, and corrode these narratives when they're false? It's, I think one potential trap in that is anything that's then seen as, as US propaganda or Western propaganda, um, that, that you know, there is a danger that can be seen as playing into the same sort of history war. But I think as long as it's done, you know, subtly and with the, you know, the great independent journalists who do work um, for these organizations, then absolutely, we should be giving every possible support we can to media organizations that are trying to make 
you know, information and, and compelling journalism available in Russian, in, in Chinese, in Korean. We should be doing everything we can to amplify alternative sources of information that are nearby that people may well be able to access. And, you know, there's something people can do right now. You know, a, a large number of Russian journalists and the, and the last remaining independent media outlets are now in, operating in exile. You know, a, a lot of them have had to flee across the border. They're running their operations uh, from, from Eastern Europe, from the, from the Baltic states. You know, one thing we could do right away, you know, for any of us who, who care about um, showing up these, you know, the, the truth about history is, is donate to these donate donate to these organizations facilitate Russian Chinese Korean journalists um, who are um, trying to do their own journalism and trying to counter these narratives and, and the other I mean the, the counterpoint to that is that also what we should not do is make it harder for scholars historians students from these countries to come here to the United States you know it it should be as as welcoming as, as possible for people to come here, pursue their research and, and not face questions about, about their loyalty um, and, and any, you know, be perceived as, as a threat when they come here. We should be, you know, opening, opening the doors, welcoming scholars to come, you know, bring, bring their resources, bring their interviews, bring their papers and pursue, pursue that research here. I should note in this context that the Wilson Center has recently started a new program to support uh, scholars who are under threat to do precisely what you just mentioned. And we're bringing Russian, we have a uh, Belarusian uh, scholar, uh, people who cannot work in their own countries. This, this is a tremendous need. Uh, and we would love to see you know, more think tanks, universities take this on as, as part of their missions for the, the reason that you mentioned. Again, if you have a question for Katie, China at wilsoncenter.org. Uh, Katie, I'd like to come back to the three country cases uh, that form the majority of, of your book. Of course, a lot of countries have victimhood narratives for very understandable reasons. We could Poland, Ireland, uh, perhaps Scotland uh, to a degree. Um, and of course, the United States narrative is mostly one of, of, of triumph. But all three of the cases that you look at, Russia, China, North Korea, manage the trick of somehow simultaneously presenting themselves as history's victim and history's victor, right? And that's a, that's a tough balance to strike. Could you maybe speak a little bit about how all three of those countries manage that and balance? When do they play the victory card? When do they play the victimhood card? And, and how is that received? Yeah, and it is a contradiction. And it's important, I think it's one of the, one of the problems with pursuing this version of history as such a central part of, of the regime's narrative is that it kind of dooms you to never be able to leave it. You can never totally win. You can never totally vanquish all of the external threats once you once you really rely on, on these you know, external enemies to, to blame all of, all of the problems on. But I think in all three cases, and I think I'll start with China because there's a really clear turn um, post Tiananmen to focus on that past victimization. There is this sense, and, and Deng Xiaoping um, identifies this in, in his speech just, just days after the, the crackdown and talks about the failure of ideological education and how we didn't do enough to teach the wider population about what China was like um, in the old days and, and what, what kind of a country China was to become. And there was then this really concerted focus and our, our, our Colleague uh, at the Wilson Center, Zhang Wang, um, writes brilliantly uh, about this, and I, I cite his research um, in my in my book about how central a part of the patriotic education campaign that then followed was this victimization narrative. You know, he he talks about this shift from what had been during the Mao years very much a, a victorious narrative. This sense that China was sort of inevitably going from one great victory to the next to really then to, to focus on how was the country humiliated? How, how was it victimized? And this sort of central slogan of, of that campaign, which is still very prevalent now of never forget national humiliation. So, that, so there was a, a really deliberate uh, shift to focus on, on what's described there as the century of humiliation and, and how the country had suffered um, in the past under imperial rule. But of course, the, you know, the end, the end message of that story and of all three stories is therefore the need for the current leadership, that how China recovered uh, from that great humiliation and, and great victimization was with the Communist Party coming to power, uniting the people, fighting back, and therefore it's essential 
um, in, in their version of, of these events that, that the Communist Party must always be in power. So, so there, is a, there is a sense that we need to focus on the victimization, but in the context that then with the right leader, you can reclaim, you can reclaim strength, you can defend the country, you can stand strong against your enemies. In the North Korean case, it's, it's interesting to see that actually when they focus on the suffering, um, particularly during the, during the Korean War, what they tend to focus on there is more the personal atrocities. So they, they in fact, have, have invented um, a, a lot of these um, really awful um, stories that, you know, the American soldiers are accused of carrying out all sorts of um, horrific you know, mass rapes, mass murders, torturing people to death, pulling them apart with oxen, you know, every every possible barbaric way to die you can you can think of. Um, American soldiers are depicted in, in North Korea um, carrying out, which which we should say is, is, is false. Um, but they focus on that and the personal attacks that that the that US soldiers are, are said to have carried out rather than the widespread destruction and the, you know North Korea was bombed to ruins um, during that war but there is less focus there it is it's part of the story but it's not the center of the story the center of the story is the evil Americans and how much Americans hate Koreans and how much they're therefore a danger a, a danger to them that's an innate part of their of their character because I think they're trying to strike this balance between well if you know Kim Il-sung was in power then why wasn't he able to do a better job of, of defending the country? Why was the country so utterly devastated? So the, the answer they've, they've come, come to is to focus on the personal and the individual and the kind of human level of that story, rather than you know, this, the massive strategic disaster that was the, 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 the early months of, of the Korean War um, for, for North Korea. So they're, they're trying to strike this balance between how we suffered and therefore why we need the strong, strong leader, and I'll, you know, I'll, I'll make this brief on, on Russia because I think we're all seeing how this narrative is is being mobilized now. But there is this sense that you know, Russia and Russia is sort of elided in in Putin's speeches with the Soviet Union more broadly that Russia and the Soviet Union suffered such devastating losses during the Great Patriotic War that they gave so many lives um, for this victory that you know, they, they focus on the sacrifice, but it's as part of this greater glorious heroic story and a sort of resurrection narrative, which ends with, you know, with, with this great victory. So there is sacrifice, there is suffering, but then there's victory, as long as you have a, a strong leader and the people gather together behind that leader, as Putin is, is insisting that they must do again now. You point out uh, repeatedly, I think very usefully in the book, that these kinds of narratives are not only used to gin up support for strong leaders, but they can actually also shape and, and limit those leaders' tactical flexibility. You write that the warped versions of history are the backdrop against which future wars uh, will be fought, and that having fetishized strength and unyielding resolve, compromise can be a risky endeavor. You just alluded to this. If, if Americans are people who pull North Koreans apart with oxen, then how can you compromise? It becomes quite dangerous. Let me get to uh, another question for you. Uh, from the audience. Uh, how is archival erasure and censorship impacting war history documentation, you know, 60, 80 years out from the war itself? Does building up these narratives require the, the destruction of, of the historical record? Yeah, that, that's one of the, I think, the main urgent issues to be concerned about now is the shutting down of archives. Um, you know, in North Korea's case, there was this, um, the scholar Fyodor Tartitsky writes about this, he calls it an arrangement of books, um, when they basically just took out <laughs> a lot of books that that um, that didn't tell the, the correct version of history, that didn't have the, the, the Kim uh, family leaders and, and, the, and the Korean partisans playing as, as central a role as possible. You know, there is a real problem with a, just a mass erasure of documents. And I think, you know, what is sad to see now is research that was possible in Russia and China until you know really quite recently. It, scholars I, I spoke to said they just you know they can't get access to those archives now. Um, it's become very sensitive and very difficult for people to go in from outside and access these documents. And we just we we don't know what's what's happening and whether you know 
perhaps, and, and we hope that these documents and these archives are being preserved and that it's just simply, you know, it's a temporary issue with, with access that, that could be restored in the future. Um, but if these, if these collections are, are lost and these documents are destroyed, you know, that will be a real loss for, for all of us because it, it, it means, you know, that these are the bare bones that, that scholars need um, to be able to, to carry out their research and to do, you know, we shouldn't respond to these, you know, the, the, this mobilization of history by then just presenting an alternative version. What we should do is, is, is complicate these narratives and, and ground them in, in you know, real experiences, real documents, real evidence, and you know, threats to the archive are, 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 are what could limit our ability to do that, or at least scholars' ability to do that in the coming years. I should note in this context the work of our colleagues at the Wilson Center's History and Public Policy uh, Center. They have a Cold War archive in which they've been working uh, with Chinese and Korean and Russian colleagues and colleagues from other nations to assemble as much of the material as we can in various languages here in, in, in one database. And so I'd encourage listeners, if you haven't visited the Cold War archives uh, at the Wilson Center, do take a look. They're, they're, they're widely used and we continue to gather these archives, uh, this archival material for precisely the reason that, that Katie just mentions. Yeah, that just um, to interject that, 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 that archive is just such an important resource. You know, I, I drew on it on it very heavily, but you know, when it, when I talk about let's make it as, as easy and as welcoming as we can for scholars to come here and to bring their research and to bring their material, you know, the, the history and public policy programs archive is, is just such a valuable treasure trove to do that, to be a repository of, of these documents and these archival sources, you know here and in a way that can be protected. Yeah, please please do visit if you haven't. Um, another question for you, Katie. How does North Korean historical interpretation impact South Korean views? We've got dueling narratives here, right? We do have dueling narratives. I mean, I think, you know, one thing that would be that would be difficult. And it, you know, I, I, I visited the 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 um, war museums on on the South Korean side too and I actually went I went to the DMZ from from both sides to to hear the kind of you know when when you're on the South Korean side you at the North Korean side of the border you're told this is the most dangerous place in the world and our soldiers are going to protect you um, from the great threat that that you face here and on the other side when you go to the DMZ from from South Korea you're told exactly the same you know a a, a, a burly soldier stands up at the front of the bus and says now we are entering the most dangerous uh, place in in the world and our soldiers. Um, are going to protect you. Um, so it, it, the, these narratives are, are weaponized on, on both sides. And I think a difficulty, you know, down the line will be reconciling, you know, I, w one potential, I think, note of, of optimism is that while, while the evidence that we have suggests that actually most of the, of the violence was, was between Koreans themselves, certainly in terms of the, you know, these terrible atrocities. And, you know, it's, it's important to say that there was the, the Nongonri massacre that, you know, there the were atrocities that US troops were carried out, but these, these terrible, um, personal, um, torturous stories, to the extent that we have any evidence that that, that happened, the, the explanation is that it's most likely into Korean violence. But the Korean part of that story isn't emphasized um, in North Korea, it's externalized. So it's, it's, the argument that they make is more about, you know, it, that it was the Koreans who were peace loving, um, you know, peaceable, um, going about their daily lives in, in North Korea. And it was the external enemies. It was the Japanese and the Americans um, who were who were the main uh, threats and the main enemies. So that the Koreans themselves haven't become so central to, to that narrative in North Korea, I think might make it more possible to reconcile um, those those dueling narratives, but again, at the moment when the, when it's so difficult to have any conversations um, between between the two Koreas, that that is a real that's a real barrier. You know, these these narratives become sealed off from each other, and each each compounds their own. Each comes to believe them and teaches them to future generations according to their own their own version of events. So, a, a related question right now: China, Russia, North Korea, uh, their relations are improving. Uh, both the, the pairs as well as, as the, the, the triangle, these relations are getting stronger. And the leaders of these countries all have, are use, use history in a similar way as you described. But they're not the same histories. They're sometimes at odds with each other. So do you see, have you looked at whether uh, that is causing any problems? Is there any desire to harmonize these histories? You know, 
to date, as far as I know, that China does not uh, deny uh, the existence of the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact, for example. Um, we know that China and North Korea have uh, very different narratives you know, of, of the Korean War and uh, even of uh, some of the earlier revolutionary period uh, in the Kim family. You know, China has been annoyed for decades that, that North Korea doesn't acknowledge uh, China's contribution to, to the Korean War. So you're going to have among a, a group that is not, not yet, it's, it's not allied, but they're working more in concert with these vital sacred histories, which are sometimes at odds. Um, where do you see that headed? I think what you tend to see in practice is them drawing on the common areas of common ground. And in the North Korean China story, it's really interesting to see, you know, it's one of the complaints that the Soviets and the Chinese make um, during the Kim Il-sung era is that they've essentially written out the, the, the Soviet and the, and the, the Soviet role in uh, liberating the, the Korean Peninsula from, from Japanese rule and then the Chinese role um, in the Korean War. There's a, there's a complaint that um, they've set up this pavilion of an exhibition um, of, of the history of the Korean War and the Chinese partisans have only gotten one tent. Um, so it's, they're, they're sort of one tiny fraction on, on the sides of the war where in real life they were absolutely critical and, and Kim Il-sung would, would certainly um, have, have lost the war without the Chinese intervention. So the, the, there have been grievances in the past about whether each country's role has been given its due recognition. But what's quite interesting to see, I think once the relationship between Xi and Kim started to thaw, um, so, so from spring of 2018, when she goes to um, North Korea for his first visit since, since, uh, since taking power, they then go to the, the monument to the friendship between their peoples and they, and they sign this, um, this document in front of this frieze um, of the Korean War history. So as and when it's useful, they refer to their shared sacrifice and their shared fight um, in this war, as, as Putin and she do too. You know, she was Putin's uh, Putin was Xi's guest of honor at that victory parade in 2015, and, and they both draw on the part of the war that gives them, firstly, gives them some stake in the in the post-war order. You know, they, they both emphasize that they were uh, their countries um, anywhere were, were joint authors um, of the UN declaration, and, and they position themselves as the countries that fought earliest, uh, fought longest, suffered most in those wars. So there are absolutely um, differences and, and discord between their narratives. But I think what we what we see as relationships are, are good is them drawing on drawing on the common ground and holding up these, uh, you know, the areas that are shared experiences. One last question uh, quickly, and I think you, you sort of touched on this, but I wanted to give you a chance uh, to say anything that you haven't been able to say in this regard. The question is that China, Russia, and North Korea all have systematic controls on the press. They do not allow foreign news stories to be published uh, inside their countries. In Russia, this is more recent, but it is, it is apparently working well. The question, how can this effectively be countered to get the truth to people in these countries? So again, without being propagandistic, as you've mentioned, is there anything else you can, would like to say about how journalists or national governments or think tanks can responsibly counter some of these tendencies? Well, I, I want to say, firstly, you know, it, it's important and it's difficult. And a, a first step, I think, is acknowledging, you know, the extent to which these information environments have become closed and understanding, you know, the ideas and the history that is animating these, these regimes that these regimes are, are drawing on. So I think, you know, firstly, acknowledging the extent of the problem really focusing on you know the nuance the details you know the, the grievances that these narratives are, are are drawing on and that these leaders are mobilizing and then you know I, I, to to reiterate i think doing everything we can to support independent journalists independent scholars independent historians you know facilitating the preservation of archival sources outside these countries you know facilitating research here by Chinese, Russian, Korean, and, and all scholars who are, who are operating in, in autocratic or oppressive environments that, that threaten their research. You know, I, I think it's important to see this and to understand this as not something that just affects citizens within these, the borders of these countries. You know, this, this affects us all, um, how this history is being mobilized. So it's in all of our interests 
um, to, to really start thinking urgently about what, what can we do? You know, how can we counter these narratives and how can we make sure that, you know, the, the, the real tools, archives, records um, that, that scholars need are, are preserved for future generations? Well, Katie, thank you. And again, congratulations. The book, see the cover here, is, is Dancing on Bones from Oxford University Press. Uh, the Wilson Center is, is just delighted to have played a role uh, in, in bringing this before the public, Katie, and we wish you the best of luck in your current work, but also with the book and your research going forward. So thank you for all you've done for the Wilson Center, and thanks to everybody uh, for joining us today. Thank you so much for having me, and it really wouldn't be a book in real life without you. Pleasure. Bye-bye.